In 1838, the Sauk war chief, Makatai Mishakakak, known to the American settlers as Black Hawk, was invited to Fort Madison in the Iowa Territory to help celebrate the 4th of July. It was there that he gave his last public speech. Get you to hell. Get you on that tour. Are you a key to an inuk? The weep of my walk. The neck on it. Up in the mascotic. Inuki. Key the name of Thorg. Money yucky. Key key the name of Kahoni. Get you on that tour. Be me key dodge. Be chemical. Men we can. Nicky. Toshi te. We shall you he looky. Chalky, we can a tea walk. Uncle Mon, a poor canny me happy me sarkin, and me got in a quay way. We shall never stay in a honey machine. She no, here my hini way. Kim on the car top. Nina, the key dog, you a half an e hikina. See boy week. Kimikwe I went with my cookie cool, a pitchy, not a chicken. No one we are more, kitchy mother to a cosky, nikani done a quani inuki, or be no much cart. You, a chalky marchy walk inuki, can we put deep in? Can you kind of deep in? Inni, as your cart, a cone akin dinner, in the kind of tea walk. ケワウヤメネポ。エコテノヨイ。ペキメコネケチウエトフィ。ウイノキナ。ケテマガシオン。ウイナ。キヤカカ。ウジオネミシャウイワニノキ。シェウエナ。アグニノケコ。イモチ
he sent a party under a white flag of truce with a message that he wanted to surrender. The flag bearers were taken prisoner, and one of them was killed. A battle erupted, and Blackhawk's warriors prevailed in what has come to be called Stillman's Run. The Potawatomi, Winnebago, and Kickapoos, encouraged by Blackhawk's victory at Stillman's Run, sent out war parties of their own. Skirmishes broke out all along the western borders of Illinois and Wisconsin. By then, Blackhawk's people were starving, eating roots, grass, and bark. Still, they were forced to push west. The final engagement occurred at the mouth of the Bad Axe River on August 1st, 1832. As Blackhawk's people tried to cross the Mississippi River into Iowa, they were attacked on both land and water. Again, they tried to surrender. Again, they were fired upon. One witness wrote that Blackhawk's people were coolly picked off by sharpshooters who exercised no more mercy towards squaws and children than they did towards braves, treating them all as though they were rats instead of human beings. In all, up to 500 of Blackhawk's people were killed at Bad Axe. On August 27, 1832, Blackhawk and several members of his band, including his two sons, surrendered to a government agent in Prairie du Chien, thus bringing an end to the last war between Native Americans and white Americans east of the Mississippi River. They were all taken prisoner and eventually incarcerated in the Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, Missouri. Blackhawk was sent on a tour of several large eastern cities. The government wanted to show him the might of the American nation so that he would realize the foolishness of ever again taking up arms against the United States. He was the object of much attention, often treated as a hero and martyr. Blackhawk was released in 1833. He eventually moved to Davis County, Iowa, to live near his friend, James Jordan. It is said that his new neighbors built him the best lodge he ever had. Black Hawk became ill in the fall of 1838. Singing Bird, Black Hawk's wife, told Mr. Jordan, if my wee -wee Black Hawk died on the third day of October, 1838. He was 71. Black Hawk was buried by his family and friends, according to his wishes, on the farm owned by James Jordan. Black Hawk was buried in Davis County, Iowa, on the Des Moines River bottom, about 90 rods from where he lived when he died. That was on the north side of the river. I have the ground on which he lived for a door yard. It'd be in between my house and the river. The only mound over that grave was uh, some puncheons split out and set over the grave and then sod it over with bluegrass, making the ridge of about four feet high. A flagstaff about 20 feet high was planted at the head on which a silk flag was hung there until the wind wore it out. My house and his were only about four rods apart when he died. He was sick only about 14 days. He was buried right where he sat the year before when in council with the Iowa Indians and was buried in a suit of military clothes made to order and given to him in Washington City by General Jackson with a hat, a sword, and gold epaulets. James Jordan. The British did not forget their old ally. The Times of London reported Black Hawk's death within six weeks of his passing. It seems fitting that Black Hawk was laid to rest on the banks of the Des Moines River, where he spent his last days among his new friends and in peace. But that was not to be. Sarah Welch Nossaman was staying in a small town near Black Hawk's grave. She reported many years later 
that on July 3rd, 1839, on a starlit night just before dark, I saw Dr. James Turner mount a large bay horse with a bald face, and heard him swear that he would have Black Hawk's head before daylight the next morning, or forever abandon all further attempts to get it. He was a well-built man, weighing about a hundred and eighty-five pounds. He put the spurs to his horse and rode away. The next morning, before daylight, Dr. Turner returned with the head of Chief Blackhawk tied up in a red bandana handkerchief. The head was hidden in the cellar for a few days. Then it was taken to the house of Jefferson Cox, where Dr. Turner and Mr. Cox boiled it in a pot in an old-fashioned fireplace. After boiling the head, so as to remove the fleshy parts, it was turned into a large tin pan and then into a tub of cold water. The skull of Black Hawk was kept at Jefferson Cox's for a while. But in a few days the Indians discovered the head had been taken from the grave, and forthwith five Indians on horses came to William Turner's and informed him that Black Hawk's head had been taken from the grave and that they wanted to see Dr. Turner, as they knew he was the man who had taken it. They were pacified for a time by telling them that Dr. Turner was in Missouri, but, in fact, he was over the river calling on patients. The Indians told William Turner that they would give him just ten days to deliver Dr. Turner into their hands, to be dealt with as they chose, and if not, then he, William Turner, would be taken. Sarah Welch Nossaman. In a panic, the Turner family fled with the skull. Later that fall, Turner returned and made off with the rest of Black Hawk's body. It is said he planned to make his fortune by exhibiting Black Hawk's skeleton in eastern cities. On January 23rd, 1840, 50 warriors appeared in Burlington, Iowa to complain to the territorial governor, Robert Lucas. My children, when I met with you at the village last spring, I told you my ear was open at all times to listen to your complaints, and that I would always be ready to make such presentation to your great father, the president, as you might wish to communicate through me. I am now ready to hear any communication you may wish to make. Any grievances you wish to lay before your great father, the president, I will now hear them. If you wish any information, or if you wish to make inquiry, I will listen and answer you promptly. Robert Lucas Loud as thunder, son of the late Black Hawk replied, Hi, <laughs> The governor assured him that such an act was an offense against the law, whether the body was that of an Indian or a white man, and that if the thief were found, he would be punished. Everyone was pleased with the discussions, and the conference adjourned, but not before Lucas invited his guests to a celebration in the Old Zion Church. The church was serving as the territorial capital. There, the sock amused a large crowd with two hours of religious and war dances. After the ceremonies, the warriors returned home, swore a solemn curse against the Turner family, 
and waited for justice. In April of 1840, a warrant was issued for Dr. Turner's arrest for disturbing the dead. He was never brought before the law. This may have been because, as some reports stated, the Turners were all dead from cholera within three years. Black Hawk's remains eventually made their way to Quincy, Illinois, to the care of a dentist named Jacob R. Hollowbush. He cleaned and varnished the bones and was wiring them when he was warned of the illegal circumstances under which they came into his possession. Hollowbush then turned them over to Ebenezer Moore, the mayor of Quincy, who in turn sent them to Governor Lucas. Blackhawk's family was sent for. When they arrived in Burlington, they were taken to the Presbyterian Church. There, the box containing Blackhawk's remains and a few of his personal items were shown to the family. When the parties were all assembled and ready for the awful developments, the lid was lifted by the governor, fully exposing the sacred relics of the renowned chief to the gaze of his sorrowing friends and the very respectable auditors who had assented to witness the impressive scene. The governor then addressed the widow through John Goodell, the interpreter of the Hardfish Band giving all the details of the transfer of the bones from the grave to Quincy and back to Burlington, and assured her that they were the veritable bones of her deceased husband, that he had sympathized deeply with her in her great affliction, and that he now hoped she would be consoled and comforted by the return of the cherished relics to her care, under a strong confidence they would not again be disturbed where she might chance to entomb them. The widow then advanced to the lid of the box, and without the least seeming emotion, picked up in her fingers, bone after bone, and examined each with the seeming curiosity of a child, and replaced each bone in its proper place, and turned to the interpreter and replied through him to the governor that she fully believed they were Black Hawk's bones, that she knew he was a good old man or that he would not have taken the great pains he had manifested to oblige her. And in consideration of his great benevolence and disinterested friendship so kindly manifested, she would leave the bones under his care and protection. Governor Lucas kept the box of bones in his office for a while, sometimes using it for a footstool. When he left office in 1841, he gave the box containing Black Hawk's bones to Dr. Enos Lowe so that they could be given to the Burlington Historical and Geographical Institute. The Institute was organized in 1843. It was located on the third floor of a building owned by Lowe on the 300 block of North Main Street in Burlington. On January 16, 1853, a fire broke out in the Institute building. The building and all of its contents were completely destroyed. And even though none of the newspaper accounts of the fire mentioned the loss of Black Hawk's bones, common belief, both past and present, holds that his remains were destroyed in the fire, his final resting place among the ashes. In spite of this, rumors persisted that Black Hawk's bones were not destroyed in the fire, but remained safe somewhere in Burlington. These rumors may have been fueled, in part, by the fact that at the time of the fire, Dr. Lowe shared an office with Dr. McLaren, not at the site of the fire on North Main Street, but rather on the 300 block of North 3rd Street. If Dr. Lowe never gave the bones to the Institute, and they were in his office at the time of the fire, they would not have been destroyed. Furthermore, Dr. John H. Rauch, the secretary of the Historical Institute at the time of the fire, intimated that the bones might not have been destroyed. Rather, he thought that Dr. Lowe may have had them in his possession. Additionally, a history of the Historical Institute was published in 1857. It discussed the fire and the losses, but made no mention of Black Hawk's remains. Also, in 1858, 
five years after the fire. Burlington hosted its first Old Settlers celebration in Marion Hall. One of the speakers, Henry Starr, who knew Blackhawk personally, mentioned that Blackhawk's bones remained in the possession of the Historical Society of Burlington. Starr was a cousin by marriage to Dr. Lowe's partner, Dr. McLaren, and may have had first-hand information. And then, in April of 1865, the editor of the Annals of Iowa, the Journal of the State Historical Society, wrote that he had good reason to believe that the old chief's bones were not consumed by the fire which destroyed the valuable collection of the Historical and Geographical Society at Burlington some years since. We are credibly informed they were at the residence of an officer of said society and thus escaped that catastrophe. Most significantly, an article appeared in the Daily Gazette in Burlington, Iowa, on August 3, 1891, that gave a detailed account of what happened to Black Hawk's remains. A white-haired and well-known Burlington citizen, who was intimate with Dr. Lowe's partner, Dr. McLaren, revealed that Black Hawk's integral and varnished remains had not been destroyed in the fire. Instead, they had remained safe in a box in the back room of Dr. Lowe's office on 3rd Street. They were later inherited by Dr. Lowe's partner, Dr. McLaren. This information had been shared with just a few people in Burlington, and nothing was done to dispel the idea that the bones had been destroyed in the fire. The newspaper account continued by stating that around 1857, Dr. McLaren noticed that the box was missing. He discreetly made inquiries around town and found out that a set of varnished bones matching the description of Blackhawk's remains had been used in a medical lecture in Burlington's First Presbyterian Church. A diligent search of the church turned up empty. However, in 1886, when the church was being torn down, a box of varnished bones was found under a staircase by a workman. They were taken to the office of George H. Lane, an attorney and member of the church. The parties who were acquainted with the incident of the disappearance of Black Hawk's bones immediately set up a theory that these were the bones. Lane deputized a man to consign the bones to a grave at Aspen Grove. The man buried them in the potter's field and left the grave unmarked. Staff at Burlington's Aspen Grove Cemetery report that they have no records showing that Black Hawk is buried in their potter's field or anywhere else in their cemetery. However, they add that detailed records were seldom kept on burials in potter's field. Nevertheless, an oral history shared among Aspen Grove workers asserts that Black Hawk was buried in a grave marked only by a stick in potter's field. And though Aspen Grove staff know the exact location of Black Hawk's grave as told in their oral history, they had been informed by others that only Black Hawk's skull had been stolen and that it had been destroyed in a fire. Based on what they had been told, they believed that their oral history was not accurate and that Black Hawk's remains were not in their cemetery. However, the oral history of Aspen Grove workers is true. Black Hawk's remains were not destroyed by the fire but rather they were safely stored in a doctor's office, moved to a church and buried in Aspen Grove Cemetery. And Potter's Field is the final resting place of Mai Kataikimishakaikaik, the Sauk war chief known to the American settlers as Blackhawk. Hawk.